This first message is a message on the search for absolute truth, part one. Before I get started, I want to start by saying and giving you the purpose of these messages. And that is the Bible warns us time and time again that one identifying mark of the last days is many will be deceived. And that false teachers would get worse and worse and that many, many people would be deceived. And that's some of you and your family and your kinfolk. It doesn't matter if you're in church, carrying a Bible or not, you can be deceived. In Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 3, Jesus' uh, disciples asked him about when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus Christ's answer to them was, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, not few. He said there would come many false teachers before his coming and would lead many astray and would deceive many, not few. That is, the majority out here is wrong. The majority of people in churches and the majority of people teaching the Bible are deceivers and most people fall and are deceived. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, the apostle Paul writing to Timothy says that the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. That is, they speak lies under the disguise of Christianity. They put on a Christian mask and a Christian costume, and then they use that cloak to speak lies to people, and they, it doesn't bother their conscience a bit because their conscience is seared with a hot iron. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy again about the last days. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, he said, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's why you choose a church based on the fact that they have a basketball gym and exercise equipment and running tracks and things for your kids and you choose a church based on all this other stuff and the Word of God or what He said and the truth of God never comes into your mind one time because you love pleasures more than you love God. He says that in the last days they will have a form of godliness. They feed the poor. They clothe the poor. They have all these programs to help people out. But they don't tell you that you're a sinner. They don't tell you that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. Amen. They don't tell you about the second coming of Jesus Christ. They don't tell you that he's going to reign on, on this earth for a thousand years. They don't tell you that the Jew doesn't just own the West Bank, but that he owns the entire Middle East from the river Euphrates down to the river of Egypt and the Mediterranean. They don't tell you those things. They have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They deny the power. The power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The Bible also said that the Holy Spirit is power. They've denied the Holy Spirit. They've denied the gospel. They've denied Jesus Christ, and they've drawn you into their church through pleasures and gimmicks and to make you feel good about yourself and to boost your self-esteem, and you go there because of how it makes you feel. You don't go there because of what God said. And Paul told Timothy that when these days come, when these last days come and you see these things, he said, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive, silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And that's what this series is about, the search for absolute truth. There's people all around this area and all around this world that's always learning, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. As we get down into verse 13, the Apostle Paul tells him, we, we, we got this teaching today in the school system, evolution, that everything's getting better, mankind's getting better, and we're going to progress and keep getting better until we bring in this perfect age. That's completely contrary to the Word of God. 
Most of your churches out there are trying to bring in a kingdom, and that kingdom won't come until Jesus Christ shows up. Amen. You can't bring it in, brother. You're too depraved. Amen. You're too wretched. You're too vile. You're too wicked to make this world uh, pleasing to God. The only man that can bring this world under subjection to God Almighty is His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul the Apostle Paul said that things are not going to get better. He said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That is, in the last days, evil men are going to continue to get worse and worse. They will continue deceiving and being deceived themselves. You've got teachers out there that I believe are sincere and honestly think they're doing a good work, but they themselves are deceived, and anybody that follows them is being deceived also. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul again, one of, the, one of the last things he writes, Paul's about to be beheaded here. He's in prison, and this is the last thing he wrote to Timothy. Paul's going home to be with the Lord, and his last concern before he left this earth was that somebody would continue to preach the Word of God. That was his last will and testament. He says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You don't want nothing to do with a church like that, do you? You don't want to be rebuked and reproved. You don't want to go to a church that tells you that you can't live with a woman and you're not married. You don't want to go to a church that tells you that it's wrong to do this and it's wrong to do that. Listen, brother, you don't have to quit doing anything to be saved. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But if you, if you want to live a good life, brother, you need reproof and rebuke in your life, and you need Jesus Christ to come in there and clean you up so that you can live the abundant life that He promised you. Amen. But you don't want to go to a church that corrects you and reproves the way you're living. You want to be your own God. You want to be your own final authority. You don't care what absolute truth is. You're deceived. All right, he goes on to say, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The average Bible-believing church today is running about 25, 30, 35 people. And they'll get up to 50 and 60, and then them 20, 25 people will leave and go somewhere else. Why? They can't endure sound doctrine. They can't, they can't stand to hear that man is nothing but a, but a, but a worm that cannot be made pure, cannot be made clean. They can't stand the preaching of the cross. It's, it's an offense to them. Amen. They can't endure sound doctrine. They run from, they, they just keep jumping from church to church until they find somebody that tickles their ears. That's right. They cannot endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That is, they find teachers that tell them what they want to hear. And they'll keep looking until they find teachers they can hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and, be sure, and shall be turned unto fables. For an example, in America today, you can go to any Christian bookstore and find 200 versions of the Word of God. 200 versions. This Bible I hold in my hand, this King James Bible, reigned supreme for 400 years. It put an end to the Dark Ages. It, it led the Great Awakening in Europe. It, it led the Reawakening and the Great Awakenings in America. Every great revival and every great soul-winning Bible preacher preached from the King James Bible. In, 19, in 1901, America turned from the King James Bible, and they've been putting out two Bibles a year for the last 100 years. And people are turning their ears from the, from the King James Bible and turn them to the NIV and the NASV and the Good News and Good Speed and Moffat and all that other nonsense because it's got something in there to tickle their ears. And God told you it would come. Right. It doesn't bother me, brother. I'll keep preaching the King James Bible and if everybody in the world's against me, I'm fine because God done warned me that men would turn their ears from the truth on the fables and when I see men putting down this blessed book and picking up all these other versions, it's just a fulfillment of what the Bible already told me was going to come to pass. Amen. That's the last days. Second Peter chapter 2. We're warned time and time again. But you don't read your Bible, do you? You, you're out here just going to a church, believing everything they say, and you have no idea how many times God warned you about the false prophets and the false teachers in the last days. No idea, because you don't read your Bible. You let, you let the guy that gets behind the pulpit every Sunday read your Bible for you. Amen. And he himself may be deceived. 
And you just take, you just swallow everything he says, hook, line, and sinker. You'll get what you deserve one day. This book is going to judge you in the last day. Amen. Second Peter chapter two, the apostle, uh, the apostle Peter says, "But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. That is, they bring in teachings that are able to damn your soul if you follow them." One of them, and I ain't scared to say, is the Church of Christ doctrine of baptismal regeneration. If your hope, if you think you're saved because you got dunked in the water, brother, then you got a false hope, and that teaching can damn your soul to hell. Amen. There's only one thing that can save your soul, and that is to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. God promised you if you do that, you'd be saved. Then he says, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many, not few, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoke, evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. That's Benny Hinn and Joel Olstein and that crowd. They're making merchandise of you with their fancy speaking. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Making merchandise of your soul. And they don't care. Their conscience is sealed, seared with a hot iron. Any man dumb enough to follow Benny Hinn going to get what he deserves one day. Amen. And I'm just telling you how it is, folks. This is absolute truth. And absolute truth is going to hurt sometimes. Amen. He says, Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Their payday is coming. And if you follow them, you'll be right there with them. In the same book, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Peter says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words. Mindful. To have your mind full of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, he wants you to have the words of God in your mind. He wants you to have your mind filled with the words of God. And He wants you to keep this in mind, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant, stupid on purpose. Amen. That's what that means. They're willingly stupid. Amen. They're stupid, willingly. Ignorant, willingly. Jesus Christ is coming, brother. Amen. Whether you want to acknowledge what's going on in this world or not, He's coming. But there are scoffers today. That's the identifying mark of the last day. Two more scriptures here and we'll move on. 1 John 2.18, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. At one point they were a part of the church, but they went out from among the church. Why? Because they weren't truly a part of the church. He said, for if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they went, they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Right. And you got you people out there making stupid statements like, why can't we all just come together and have one church? That's right. That'd be fine by me, brother, but we're going to preach the truth. Yeah. And you and your crowd ain't going to stick around long because you're not of us. Man. We believe the King James Bible. We believe in salvation by the grace of God. Amen. We believe in salvation by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Only. We believe in standing on the Word of God. Amen. And we don't believe in this, all this other nonsense you people are preaching out there. And you'll come here and you'll stay here for about five days and we'll offend you and you'll run off and start another church. You'll Amen. start a full gospel or, or some other community church down the road because you're not of us. That's right. If you were of us, you'd be standing right here with us. Amen. Amen. But you ain't of us. We're putting these videos out to try to get you the truth so that you can be with us. Amen. Brother, there's not a doubt in my mind. You people been in church 30, 40 years and can't even say for sure whether you're going to heaven or not when you die. Brother, I know where I'm going when I die. Amen. Amen. I have peace when I lay my head down at night. Amen. And when I, if I die that night, brother, I'm going to 
go to be with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen. and you've been at this thing 40 years and still have no assurance of salvation even though God said you could know you have eternal life. Amen. Amen. But you didn't know He said that. Why? You don't read your Bible. You could care less. You say you love the Lord but Christ said if a man love me he'll keep my words. You run around saying you love the Lord because you go to church and all this other nonsense, but you ain't picked that book up and really read it and studied it a day in your life. Yeah, man. You don't love Him. Just point blank, period. Alright? 1 John 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false, many, many, not few. You catching the theme? You catching the theme? Many shall find the way to destruction. Few shall find the way of life. Amen. And you just think that everything's Christian in this world, don't you? You think you think you see a Roman Catholic out there uh, uh, feeding little hungry babies, and you think that's Christian? Well, if that Roman Catholic is trusting in that feeding that little baby to get it to heaven, it ain't Christian at all. That's right. It's satanic self righteousness is what it is. Amen. Don't believe everything, brother. Many false prophets are gone out into this world. Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That has nothing to do with healing, like all you people think it does. Y'all right. use that verse, oh, greater is him that is in you, and you have no idea what it's talking about. It's talking about the spirit of truth that indwells me, and if it indwells you, should help you overcome all the lies and the deception that is in this world. Yeah. Amen. That's what it's talking about. Amen. But you don't, you don't really care about what it's talking about. You just want it to say what you want it to say. He says, they are of the world. There's only two type of people in this world. Those who dwell with the Spirit of God and those who dwell with the Spirit of this world. And those that are of God, it says, they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. They hear it. You flock to people that speak of the world, because you're of the world, and they are of the world. And birds of a, of a feather flock together. Amen. You got it? But then he says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that knoweth not God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's how we know it. The spirit of error is, if you can't hear me and understand what I'm talking about, and spiritually understand what I'm talking about, it's because you're not of God. That's right. If you can hear Joel Osteen and all them characters, it's because you're of the world. That's your kind, and I'll stick to my kind, and I hope, you, I hope I can bring you to my side. Now, in spite of all these warnings about the last days, <clears throat> multitudes have fallen victim to the deception and the seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils that's going on in these last days. Jesus Christ said back in Matthew 24 to take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed. Many shall be deceived. He just said take heed that you're not one of them. Yes. You don't have to be one of them. When Paul wrote about those evil men and seducers in the last days, he told Timothy, Timothy, just continue in the things that thou hast learned and seen in me. He said, when these evil men seducers are getting worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, just continue in the things which you have seen and heard. We're going to keep standing and continuing in the things that has been assured to us by God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We don't care if our attendance drops down to five. Amen. Or four or three. We're going to keep standing, brother. By the time that Jesus Christ had 5,000 following him at one time, and by the time he got done preaching, he had 12. Amen. The Apostle Paul preached all over Asia Minor and all over parts of Europe. And by the time he died, there was only one man left with him. That's how it goes. Amen. You start weeding them out, brother, when you start growing in the Lord. You start weeding them out. So we don't care. We ain't in this for attendance or money. We're in this for the proclamation of the truth of God. Amen. <clears throat> Paul said to withdraw 
from this situation in these last days. John said to try the spirits, and you're running around, oh, judge not this to be judged. You're told time and time again in that Bible to judge. Amen. Quit taking Jesus Christ out of context to justify not judging each other's sin. Yeah. That's right. What Jesus Christ said was first get the moat out of thine eye that you can clearly see to help your brother. He never said not to judge him. He said judge yourself first. Amen. You're told time and time again to judge. The Apostle Paul said he that is spiritual judge of all things. Jesus Christ commended the church over in Revelation because they tried them and say they are apostles and are not and found them liars. They judged them and found them to be liars and Christ applauded them for it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> John told you to try the spirits, to judge them, to see whether they're of God or not. <clears throat> Only a fool would go around through this world not judging things. That's right. Well, I don't want to discriminate. Next time you come to a red light, brother, treat that red light the same way you would a green light. See how that works out for you. That's right. You got to get it, brother. You got to get it. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. You better judge. <coughs> Now, all these warnings in the Word of God, take heed, withdraw, continue, try the spirits. And yet you people are out there going to churches based on the programs they got. Oh, they have such a powerful music ministry there. Or they've got so much things for my kids to do. What if they're lying to your kids and your kids go to hell because of that? Amen. Never crossed your mind, did it? You don't care. You really don't. You're out there picking churches based on that's where my mommy and daddy go and that's where I want to go. Well, if you want to spend eternity with your mommy and daddy, it's fine. That's right. Maybe your mommy and daddy's going to hell. Maybe you need to step up to the plate and start finding and learning some truth so that you can keep your mommy and daddy from going to hell. You ever thought about that? Amen. This life's only temporary. The things that are seen are temporal. You're going to bury mommy and daddy one day Jesus Christ said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Amen. The eternal words of God. You, you have no regard to whether or not that church is proclaiming the truth of God or not. I mean, you go to a church and you got women standing up speaking in tongues and getting behind the pulpit preaching where that Bible clearly says to let your women keep silence in the church. But you don't care, do you? You like the way it makes you feel. Yeah, that's right. You really don't care. You go to church and they're sitting there speaking on tongues, and that Bible said if any man speak in an unknown tongue, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent. But you don't care. Then you pretend to interpret, and I've been, I've, I've seen you, I've seen you people interpret them tongues, and I tell you, I've never gotten any, I've never gotten anything out of it. I get more out of the Word of God than I ever would out of somebody speaking in tongues and somebody claiming to interpret that. Amen. I'd rather, I'd, listen, Paul said I'd rather speak five words, five words with understanding than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. Amen. Jesus Christ died for sinners. There's five words, and that's more than 10,000 in any unknown tongue. Amen. Amen. But is that you and your family? Is that how y'all are acting? If it is, it's because you and your family are simple and unwise. Proverbs 14, 15 said, The simple believeth every word, but a prudent man looketh well to his going. Only the simple man believes every word. A prudent man checks things out. I don't want you to believe anything I'm telling you. I want you to get your Bible out, watch this video, get you a King James Bible, and see if what I'm telling you is the truth. If you don't, if you don't do that, you don't check me out, you're a fool. Man. You're unwise. That's right. You're supposed to check me out. Tell them all. The, Bere right. the Berean Christians in Acts chapter 17, even the Apostle Paul, they got their Bibles out and checked it to see if what he was saying was so. And if you don't do that, it's because you're unwise. God is going to shortly punish this deceived generation of people very shortly. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read about the judgment that's coming on this earth real quick. And you see, people don't know God at all. Y'all just run around, oh, God is love. Y'all make God some hippie that is not. If all God is is love, then God is a pervert. 
Let me say that again. Y'all you people that all you talk about is the love of God, you turn my Lord into a pervert. Right. If there's not some things God hates, then God is a pervert. You mean to tell me God loves murder and child molestation and rape and, and uh, a drug dealer out here destroying a 12-year-old's life selling crack and oxycontins and all that? That's God? God loves that stuff? No, that Bible says God hates you, you run around and say, oh, but God, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And that's nowhere in your Bible. You couldn't find that 10,000 years in your Bible. Amen. That Bible said God hateth all workers of iniquity. Amen. He doesn't hate their iniquity. He hates the ones that work it. Right. And his love for a sinner was a one-time shot that happened 2,000 years ago. He so loved, past tense, he so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's God's love for a sinner. If you don't come to that cross and accept, accept the love of God right there, it's all she wrote for you. Amen. You're done. But Paul right here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, talking about the day of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Apostasy. There's going to have to come a time when men reject the truth. He says, And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He comes on over here, and he says, he talks about, he says, The mystery of iniquity doth already work, and only he who now letteth will let to be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. That's the Antichrist whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him, the Antichrist, listen, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. That's right. You following signs, are you? You think God only confirms his message through signs? You don't think the devil can do those things? You people out there, y'all make stupid statements all the time like all sickness comes from Satan and all healing comes from God. What about that beast in Revelation 13 who has a deadly wound to his head and that deadly wound is healed by the dragon? You better hope you're not here with Amen. that philosophy. Amen. If you think all healing comes from God, you know you're going to think Satan's God when he heals the deadly wound of the beast. You know what that comes from? It comes from watching too much 2020 and 60 minutes and not reading enough of the Word of God. Amen. That's where it comes from. Been reading the funny pages for too long. Now this man comes with all power, signs, and lying wonders. He's got power to call, the false prophet has power to call down fire from heaven. Whole world will go after him thinking he's God. He comes with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because, remember the title of this message, Search for Absolute Truth, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Amen. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Amen. You don't know that God, do you? You don't know a God that'll, that'll send you a lie for the sole purpose of damning you to hell. You see, you're going through here, you're tearing through this thing, you're not truly searching for the truth, and God knows that. Amen. Every time you open this Bible, that Bible said in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, that this Bible is a discerner of the intents of the heart. That's right. It knows your it knows why you're opening this book up. Are you picking it up to justify Pentecostal doctrine? God already knows it. If you're if you pick this Bible, listen, brother, if you pick this Bible up as a Baptist, a Methodist, a Pentecostal, a, a Catholic, the Bible knows that. It already knows that. The best way to open this Bible up is with an humble and broken heart. Amen. Amen. Seeking the truth of God. That's the only way to pick that book up. And it'll discern that. And when it discerns that intent of your heart, it'll show you the truth. God knows you. He knows whether you want the truth or not. And if you don't want the truth, He's going to send you a lie to damn you. Amen. You don't believe that, do you? You don't believe God. I just read it to you. God 
I shall send them strong delusion. How about Ezekiel 14 for you? You people know nothing about this God. You don't know who you're messing with. You really don't. God, you're dealing with a God that said, I'd rather you be cold or hot rather than lukewarm. He either wants you to know the truth, just quit making stuff up. You don't know anything about this God that I'm talking about. You don't know who you're messing with. Amen. He, listen, brother, that book can destroy you as quick as it can save your soul. Yeah. Right. There are as many people going to hell quoting Bible as there are going to heaven quoting Bible. There's more people going to hell quoting Bible than there are people going to heaven quoting Bible. Why? Because that book discerns your heart and God tore you to shreds. That book will chew you up and spit you out if you pick it up with the wrong heart. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 14, God asked Ezekiel here, he said, Son of men, these men have set up idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to to the multitude of his idols that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. You know what God said? He said, whatever's in your heart, that's how I'll answer you. That's right. That he, that he may take you according to your own heart. You know how God takes the wise? In their own craftiness. That's right. That's how he takes you. The, the worst thing God can do to you is give you over to your own heart. Amen. And let you believe that your heart was telling you the truth. Amen. The Bible says the heart of man is wicked. Des uh, the, the Bible says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The worst punishment God can give you is to give you over to your own heart. That's right. Still don't believe God do things like that. How about Deuteronomy chapter 13? Here, here's one for all you signs people out there. There comes a time when God expects you to grow up and walk by faith. Not, not by sight. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go. Now listen, it doesn't matter what he did. God said, I ain't worried about the signs or the wonders. If he does a sign or a wonder in you, he said, if he does a sign or a wonder, he said, I want you to pay attention to what he's saying. It's not about what he can do. I don't care if Benny Hinn heals people. I don't, I, mean, I don't believe he does. Don't get me wrong. But even if he did, it ain't about what he's doing. It's about what he says. Amen. That's what we're concerned with is the truth. God said if this prophet comes and his sign or wonder comes to pass and he says, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or the, that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth you. Amen. God's trying you. You see? What's he trying you? To see if you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Amen. The Bible says if a man love me, he'll keep my words. And God, God, will, God will let a, a man come with signs and wonders and then speak contrary to his word and see if you'll follow him or not. That's right. He's trying you, proving you. Now that scripture there is prophetic about the false prophet that's going to come upon Israel in the last days. And I'm just telling you what kind of God you're dealing with. You don't know nothing about it. One more. First Kings. Still don't believe it? First Kings. Chapter 22. What's going on here is God's trying to figure out a way to kill Ahab. God's got a counsel going on in heaven. It says, Verse, verse 19, he said, Hear therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. All the host of heaven are around the most high God. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth, Ramoth Gilead? He said, Who's going, how, how can we persuade Ahab to go to this place so we can, kiss, so we can have him killed? <laughs> Is that the God you know? That's the God of the Bible. He says, and one said on this matter, and another said on that matter. There came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? How? How are you going to persuade him? And that spirit said, I will go forth. 
and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, God says, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Amen. God said, Go down there and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. Lie to Ahab so we can get him to come down to this place and kill him. That's right. That's God you're dealing with. He's not playing games with you. You either want his truth or you don't. He knows it. He knows it. So now we're going to begin a series of messages here. It's going to be about four or five parts, this first series of messages, on the search for absolute truth and the progress through which, the, the process through which God reveals to mankind his truth. There's God is a God of order. That all things be done decently and in order. God is not the author of confusion. You understand that? God always has a process in everything that he does. Now, this process through which God gives us revelation is a progressive revelation. He progressively gives us the revelation. Now, the first, the first revelation that he gives man is a natural revelation to all men. You don't need a Bible. You don't need a church. You don't need a religion. God has given to all mankind a natural revelation. You can see it anywhere. You don't need a Bible or a church to get what I'm about to give you. The second revelation he gave man is a supernatural revelation. It's the written word of God. That's the second step. Once you accept the first revelation, you move on to the second one. Once you get the second one, God gives you the third revelation. And that revelation is God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen. This Bible is designed to bring you to Jesus Christ. And once, you, once you're brought to Jesus Christ, you get the new birth, and the Holy Spirit of God, known as the Spirit of Truth, comes and dwells, and dwells you, and He come to lead and guide you into all truth. That's how God reveals truth to mankind. Amen. You've got to first believe that God is. Amen. Then you have to diligently seek God in His Word. And when you seek Him in His Word, He'll reveal His Son to you. And when you accept His Son, He that hath the Son, the same hath the Father. Jesus Christ said, If a man love me, he'll keep my words. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And we will come and make our abode in Him and manifest ourselves to Him. Amen. That's it. That's how God reveals truth. Now this first revelation God has given to all men is creation. It's a natural revelation. You don't need a Bible to see it. The fact that you exist. I'm not shoving religion down your throat at this point. I'm not shoving Bible down your throat at this point. I'm talking about the fact that you're sitting there, that you exist, that you're breathing air, you're stuffing food down your belly, you drive a car, you live on planet Earth in a solar system, part of a Milky Way galaxy in the universe. That's not Bible. That's not religion. That's not Christianity. That's cold, hard reality. Are you here? Do you exist? Are the trees out there there? Are the birds there and the animals and the stars and the planets, are they there? That's what we're talking we're called. That's existence. That's God's natural revelation to man. The fact that you're here on this planet is a revelation of, of God. This is a reality that all men must face. Scientists, doctors, scholars, homeless men, poor men, rich men, kings, presidents, police officers, firemen, they all have to face this reality that they're here. There was a time when they wasn't, they showed up. What do you want to know about it now? The question is, how did you get here? Now everybody's there. They've tried to answer this question. It's a question that must be asked. You're here. How did you get here? And what's your purpose? Why are you here? Now, there's only four possibilities of how we got here. Only four. Uh, I don't want to give my phone number out on this thing because I'd have every person in this area calling and giving me a mouthful. But if you can think of one possibility other than the four I'm about to give you, I'd like to hear it. Because there's, there's only four possibilities of this planet being here and then stars being there and you being here and all the animals being here. There's only four possibilities. And the first possibility of how we got here is it came from nothing accidentally. You know what they call that? They call that science. 
They call that the Big Bang. It came from nothing accidental. In other words, there was, there was no intelligence behind it. It was just an accident. Brother, it takes more faith to believe that nonsense than it does God creating it. Now, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the scientific facts. They call this science, but I'm going to show you science proves this wrong. Laws of science, proven science, Big Bang Theory. It's not Big Bang fact, it's Big Bang Theory. The facts of science prove that it couldn't happen. But they don't want to tell you that. Why? Because the God of this world is Satan, St. Corinthians 4.3, and he's in charge of the school systems. And he's in charge of the universities and the politicians. And he's a liar from the beginning and the father of it. Amen. And he ain't going to give you or your kids the truth. And he'll beguile you through subtle words, brother. And we'll look at some of them words here in a second. A second possibility is it's eternal. It's always been here. The universe has always been here. That's a possibility. We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about Bible. Those are two possibilities. Third possibility is it's all just an illusion. It's not real. Is that, is that a possibility? It's a possibility. It's possible that none of this is real. It's just, just some kind of illusion. That's the route Buddha and them guys took. Number four. It came from nothing supernatural or intelligent. came from nothing intelligently. In other words, an intelligent being created. Now there are no other possibilities. It's either not here, or if it is here, it's either always been here, or there was a time it wasn't here, and it got here either intelligently or on accident. Either something created it, or it just happened by chance, or it's always been here, or it's not real. You have no other possibilities. None. There are no other possibilities. Those are man's options. Those are your options. At this point, we're not even discussing Bible. We're discussing the fact that you exist. The question is, how did you get here? How did we get here? How did the universe get here? Was it accident, intelligence? Has it always been here? Or is it all just an illusion? That's the reality. You accept that? You have to accept that. I'm telling you plain facts. You're here. Now, let's look at the realities of, of this situation. Let's look at the realities of it. This one right here is called science. Called the Big Bang. That's what they teach my kids in the school system. That's what they teach your children. That's right. That's what they teach in the, in the universities. And they teach it like it's just cold, hard facts. Billions and billions and billions and billions of years ago, that's how fairy tales begin. Once upon a time. Amen. That's how fairy tales start. Evolution in the Big Bang is a fairy tale for grown-ups. That's what it is. And you buy it and accept it because you don't want to face the fact that there's a God you have to answer to. Amen. Amen. It came from nothing. You ain't never checked this out. You've never checked it out to see if it's true or not. Some, some guy with a PhD stood up in front of him and used a bunch of fancy words and you swallowed a hook, line, and sinker. And never checked him out on the facts. This one right here is a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. It's not science. That is not science. The first law of thermodynamics is science. It can be proved anytime, anywhere, on planet Earth, on the moon, on Mars. It can be proved under any circumstances. The first law of thermodynamics states that matter nor energy can be created or destroyed. Energy can only be transformed or transferred. You can't create matter. You want to try it? You want to put me to the test? Go out here and take nothing and turn it into something. You can't make something out of nothing. This can be proved anywhere. 
You cannot create matter. We build houses out of matter that already exists. That's right. You can't make something out of nothing. And yet that's what that says. But you see, they got a, the scientists have a way of prettying things up for you. They know how stupid it sounds, so here's how they'll say it. Billions and billions of years ago, matter overcome antimatter. Let me put that in hillbilly terms for you. Once upon a time, something overcame nothing. Matter is this wood, this board, this. That's matter. Antimatter is not this wood, not this. Antimatter is nothing. But you see, they couldn't just say something or nothing. They had to pretty it up for you with their scholar and educational words to make you think something special was going on and nothing special was going on at all. They're talking like fools. Long time ago, something or nothing became something and then it compressed into a tiny dot and spinned and generated enough energy and exploded and created everything you see. You know what they call that today? They call that science. And you were warned in 1 Timothy 6.20 by those who swear by science falsely so called. The word science means knowledge. And Paul, Paul warned you about men who would swear by science falsely so called, or in other words, it's falsely called science because it's not knowledge at all. They're swearing by a bunch of theories today. Darwin's theory of evolution being shoved down my children's throat and my tax dollars going to support it. You know what evolution is? It's a religion. Amen. It ain't science at all. There's no knowledge in it. They ain't, can't prove it and they never could prove it. And they never will prove it. That's right. But yet my tax dollars is going to fund. You got the Supreme Court saying today that all truth is relative. There are no absolute truths. And then they get my kid in the school system and they only teach him one of the four possibilities. Isn't that strange? There's no absolute truth, but then they get there and teach that one as absolute truth, and they don't even give him the other three possibilities. Amen. That's what's going on in America today. Why? Because Satan's in charge. Amen. Amen. You were warned in that Bible to stay away from two things, science and philosophy. And they're destroying the world like that. Colossians 2.8, Paul said this, I say, lest any man should beguile you, through vain, through vain word, through philosophy, and vain words after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. And in 1 Timothy 6, 20, he warned you about science. They beguile you with their words. You know what science can't tell you? They can tell you that matter overcome antimatter and then it blew up. They can't tell you where the matter come from. That's right. They can't tell you where it came from. Where did the something pop up from? Where did the something come from? The first law of thermodynamics said it can't be created. So we've ruled number one out. So then if it couldn't have been created from nothing, then it has to be eternal, right? This one here is a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. God just put you in a pickle, didn't he? It couldn't be created and it couldn't be eternal. See your two options now? You're either going to have to go with God or lose your mind. That's where God puts you, brother. And you don't need a Bible or any religion to do this to you. You just got to look at the stars and ask yourself where they come from. And once you work, once you rule out these two, you're either going to come to the conclusion that it's not real and be locked up in the loony bin, or you're going to have to come to the conclusion that God made it. Amen. You say, what is the second law of thermodynamics? It's the law of conservation of energy. Entropy. With the passage of time, there's always less energy to work with. Ask yourself. Science will tell you. Every scientist on this earth has to acknowledge that our sun's burning out. Burning some two million, two billion some tons of energy a day. And it's going to go out. It's losing energy. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, quit eating for a day. Quit eating for two days. Quit eating for three days and see if you feel like getting up and doing anything. Amen. Why? You're losing energy. I can prove it right here. This is entropy. Second law of thermodynamics. 
I'm putting energy into that pen. And it'll keep doing that as long as I keep putting energy in it. But the longer I do it, I'm losing energy. And eventually that thing's going to stop. It can't be eternal. The universe would have burned out billions of years ago. It couldn't be eternal. So God's got you in a pickle, don't He? How do you explain everything being here? It can't be eternal. And it couldn't have been created from nothing on accident. It's got to be an illusion then. That's where Buddha went. That's where Buddha and the Hindus and all them went. Mind over matter. Mind over matter. Matter's not real. Our mind is what's real. And mind over matter. That was almost right. The things that are seen are temporal. things that are not seen are eternal. But they try to prove that the universe and all this stuff is an illusion by running across hot coals really, really fast. That's just stupid. That's not, that's just, that's just a law of science. If I run across it real fast, my foot ain't touching it long enough to, for it to burn. Have you ever seen these Hindus sitting down in hot, in, in, in airports and set themselves on fire? I've seen them do it. Boy, it scorches them good. When they get done, there ain't nothing but bone and dust left. If you believe it's an illusion, stick your hand in a 2,000 degree fire and see what happens to you. It's going to be the same thing that happens to me. There ain't no mind over matter. That fire is real and your hand is real. And if you put your hand in it, it'll burn you. Damn, man. Hot is hot, cold is cold. And Einstein didn't know what he was talking about with relativity. There are absolute truths. If you don't believe in absolute truths, go jump off a building and see what happens to you. Gravity. It's the same for me and everybody else in this world. It can't be an illusion. It can't be. You're on your way to dope and a straitjacket if you start believing this one. You'll, start, man. you'll start calling evil good and good evil. There are no absolutes. It's not real. That's where you're headed. So what's the, what's the only option? What is the only possibility that fits science? That there's a God that made it. It's the only, the only real possibility. You say, but matter can't be created. So how did God create it? God isn't bound by the laws of what He made. Bill Gates created Windows 98, but if you think He's governed by the laws He wrote on that program, you're crazy. God lives outside of what He made. Amen. God created the first and second laws of thermodynamics. But you're told in that Bible that God is the Holy One that inhabits eternity. Time is a non-issue to God. God's not bound by time. That's right. God's not bound by the laws that He created in this physical creation. There are no laws of nature. The Bible said that nature obeys the ordinances of God unto this day. They obey what He said in the beginning. Amen. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let the earth bring forth, and it brought forth. And they're still continuing under those laws unto this day. They're not laws of nature. They're laws of God that nature obeys. Amen. God. Creation is the only real possibility. I'm about done here. God's first revelation to man that He gives us is His existence. How did He reveal it? In what He made. You don't need a Bible. You don't need a church. You don't need a religion. All you need to do is open your eyes. God revealed Himself and what He made. He reveals it by the existence of everything. Psalm 19, 1 through 4 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out throughout the whole earth. Amen. The stars and the days and the creation speak to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people on this earth. And there's no language nor speech nor any place of this earth where the creation is not spoken to man. That's why every culture in this world has a God. Amen. Now they, according to Romans, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man. That every, every tribe of people and every race of people has looked up at the heavens and said, there must be a God. 
Then they became vain in their imagination and they changed him into Ra and Horus and Osiris and Thor and Odin and, and all these other gods, all the, and all these other gods that these tribes of these peoples come up with. But they knew one thing, that creation revealed that there was a God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 21 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because here's the truth they possess. Every man possesses this truth. There's no such thing as an atheist. No such thing. Every atheist out there possesses a truth, but he holds that truth in unrighteousness. Here's the truth they possess. Because that which may be known of God is known in them, is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. God has showed man something. He showed them a truth. And they now hold this truth in unrighteousness. What truth was it that he showed them? For the invisible things of him are clear from the foundation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That means the things that are made reveal that there's a God and he's all powerful. Yeah, and you're without excuse. Now the first thing God wants you to come to a knowledge of, a few more minutes here, the first truth mankind must accept is the existence of God. In Exodus 3.14, Moses came to God there in that burning bush. God says, I want you to go down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses said, when I go down there, they're going to want to know your name. What shall I tell them? God said, I am that I am. That was the first thing he wanted Israel to know. He said, tell them I am that sent me unto you. There's nothing mysterious in that name. All God was saying was, people look for mysterious things, and the truth is just as plain as day. It's right there. All God was saying was, I exist. And he proved it. When he went down there and he brought those 12 plagues upon Israel or upon Egypt, 10 plagues upon Egypt. Each plague was an attack on one of the gods of Egypt. And God was proven, I am the existent one. I'm the real existence. I am. You know what they call him in heaven today? There's four beasts around his throne right now as I'm sitting here teaching and I like to think about it. One of these days, brother, I'm going to get to go up there and hear him sing it myself. Amen. But there's four beasts around his throne day and night, and they don't stop but cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Amen. You know what they're calling him? They're calling him the eternal existence. He was, he is, and he is to come. I am. Amen. Amen. He's called the I am, the existence. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, when Jesus Christ showed up on this earth, and John and them heard him talk and seen him and walked with him them three and a half years, they said, That which was from the beginning, the existence, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, not a life, the life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. 1 John 5, 20. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true. Even in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Existence, the eternal life. The fact that God is. That's where this Bible begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This Bible doesn't waste five minutes of its time trying to convince an atheist that God doesn't know what God says about him. Said so the fool said in his heart, there is no God. God don't have anything else for him. Amen. Until you accept what God has shown you in the creation, and that, that is the fact that he is there and he's real, and he's eternal and all powerful. Until you accept that, this book has nothing to say to you. That's right. It begins Amen. by saying in the beginning, God. It takes God as existent. 
This Bible doesn't waste five minutes trying to convince you that there is a God. If creation can't do that, then I'm sorry about your luck. If you want to believe the dumb scientist out there, go right ahead. But I see too much. Listen, brother, I see the birds and I see the animals and I see how deer act in the woods and I something intelligent put that wisdom in them animals. Something intelligent. Something intelligent gave them animals wisdom. The Bible begins within the beginning God. It does not try to convince a person that there is a God. Every nation knows that there is a God. It's a question of whether you're going to get to know Him or not. Amen. Hebrews 11, 6 says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is. God said, I am. That's the first name God gives. I am that I am. It's up to you to figure out who He is. But you've got to first accept that He is. And Hebrews 11, 6 goes on to say, He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You must first believe He is and then diligently seek Him. Creation reveals His existence, but just because you believe He is doesn't mean anything at all. James 2.19 says, The devils believe and tremble. He said, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. Just because you believe that there is a God doesn't mean you're out of the woods yet. That's right. John 17.3, Jesus Christ said, This is eternal life that they might know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That's Jesus Christ's definition of eternal life. Amen. It's to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. God wants us to diligently seek him. Last verses and I'm done. Acts 17, 22 through 28. Paul preaching there in Athens, Greece. Them intelligent people. Athens was known for their philosophy and their universities and Every major university in America today has its roots in Athens, Greece. That's why every fraternity has Greek letters on their name. But Paul preaching to them men walked by and seen an altar there that said to the unknown God. And Paul said, whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the heaven and the earth and all things therein. You know what he said about him? He said that he made of, he made of one blood all nation of people on this earth. And he set their boundaries. He told the blacks to take Africa and the, and the Caucasians to take Europe and the Asiatics to take Asia. And he separated mankind to put them in isolation that they might seek after God. That they might seek after Him and feel after Him if happily they might find Him though He be not far from any one of us. Amen. For in Him we move and live and have our being. As one of your own poets said, we are all His offspring. Amen. God wants you to seek for Him. God wants you to seek His truth. He's revealed that He's there in the creation. Now He wants you to diligently seek Him. And the next message on the search for absolute truth will be on the second revelation God has given us. It's a written revelation. God wrote it in our hearts and then He wrote it Pure in his book. It's a written revelation from God Almighty called the Word.